Welcome everybody to our 2023 Aikido Solstice Seminar, <laughs> Summer Solstice. And this year, I'm, I'm Jamie Zamoranto uh, and our committee is here. You can see us with the flags. And that's how you know that we're part of the Solstice Committee that's, that's hosting this. Um, so welcome one and all, thank you for being here. Very important topic, how healthy is your dojo? And a very, we think juicy topic and conversation and discussion. So um, I'll just get started and say that how healthy is your dojo? We've chosen, and I want to acknowledge Janice, uh, it was her idea to think about this as flags, uh, yellow, green, and um, red flags. So of course, yellow, uh, sorry, green flags are what are some of our best dojo practices? What makes a good dojo? And uh, looking at how healthy is yours, maybe some get some ideas of some things that you'd like to implement from this conversation. Red flags are clearly like, uh oh, watch out, maybe that's not so great. Is this going on in my dojo? Um, what 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 could be done to change that? And yellow is mm, maybe maybe yeah. Um, and a lot of these, uh, some one person's red flag is another's green, another way around. Uh, so. You know, the, things aren't necessarily completely clear cut. Some are, some aren't. Some I think are non-negotiables. Others are, depends how you look at it, depends how this is being done. So uh, we hope to have a really fruitful discussion today. Uh, <clears throat> let me just say, when you share, please be mindful of two things. One is the your tone. We don't wanna be negative or attacking anybody. Uh, or anything. So watch your tone and also watch the length of your share because we do have you know, a number of people here and we want everybody to have an opportunity to express yourself. Uh, you can also use the chat if you have questions or some, some comments uh, about things that you're hearing. So I'll just say that, uh, again, my name's Jamie. A lot of, uh, I know a lot of you, not everybody. I've been training for 47 years. I don't have a dojo currently. I did start a dojo in San Francisco. It started out as the Women's Aikido School, became the Aikido Arts Center. I had it for about 15 years. And since then I've been kind of a traveling sensei. I've had the opportunity to train with a lot of different teachers and organizations. I visit a lot of dojos, I guest instruct. So I'm, I feel fortunate that I'm able to get a view, a pretty broad view of the Aikido world and practices and dojos. Uh, I'll share for me, one of the things that I'll just kind of toss out as a green flag is <laughs> that people feel safe and feel safe physically and emotionally as well. And that it gives the student the feeling of, oh, I wanna go. <laughs> I wanna go train today. I like going, it feels good, it feels empowering. And when I leave, I feel better than before I went to class. So that has to do with Aikido, but it very much has to do with the sensei and also the dojo culture and community. So that's me and who wants to take it next from our committee? Okay. No, baby. Yeah. Uh, I can go next. Uh, yeah, if everyone could please mute themselves when they're not ta directly talking, uh, especially the moderators, because otherwise we're gonna hear the ding ding every time someone comes in the waiting room. But uh, I guess that's a good thing. Uh, yeah, so my name is Lisa Klein. I have a dojo in New Haven, Connecticut. Uh, I've been in a variety of Aikido organizations um, and uh, seen a lot of different approaches to Aikido in my training, including uh, three years in Japan. Um, and I, I wanted to say my green flag is joy, smiles on the mat. I was just at an event this past weekend where there were a lot of smiles, a lot of joy, and that's what I want in my Aikido, and that's where what I think um, we can bring to the world in a, in a tough time, we can bring joy. So let's, uh, for me, a green flag is seeing smiles and the converse, uh, the, a red flag is not seeing any smiles on the mat. So that's me, I'll pass it on. Nilu, did you wanna go next? Sure, uh, most people know me by Nilu and I'm starting to go by my full name, Nilu Fad. My family is um, from Iran. Uh, I was born in Maryland, grew up in the U.S., um, started Aikido when I was 20, almost 30 years now. I've been training um, in the USAF and then Birankai and traveled all, mostly up and down the West Coast, East Coast and West Coast. Um, I've had uh, roles sort of in leadership, so I've seen sort of the depth of those organizations, um, at least uh, mostly in Birankai. And it 
I felt really passionate after the women's um, coalition to bring forward my story with my first teacher um, in the Me Too Aikido uh, website and sort of movement that I feel is really important. And these kinds of events are bringing these um, sometimes difficult conversations forward and making it more comfortable and making it safer um, to train in our little environments. Um, so one of my green flags is, um, is around consent. So I'm gonna kind of do the flip side of that as um, a red flag being when you do say something in the dojo, um, yes or no, whether that is um, accepted or not by your instructor. And so when you say no, if that is, um, sometimes the culture or the etiquette is that you don't ever wanna say no to your chief instructor. And so taking that, do people, um, are you allowed to say no um, when you're in a dojo? Thanks, I'm gonna pass it. Um, Ari, do you wanna go? Sure. Um, so I run a dojo in upstate New York um, and I've been involved uh, in the background with a number of organizations and efforts that are, um, feel like we have a lot of work to do, but work that can be done to help Aikido, our practice and our communities to evolve and become more ethical um, and become uh, relevant uh, moving into the future. Um, I, we, our dojo is independent currently, and we come from an organization where, interestingly, a lot of what at the time I saw as green flags over time became red flags to me. Um, and to uh, dovetail off of what Nilu brought up about consent, one thing that has come to me over time is um, one of my biggest green flags is Number one, that you are, uh, first of all, allowed to say no to anyone, including your primary teacher, chief instructor. Um, but that also, when you do say no, it is just as welcomed as when you say yes. I'm gonna pass it on for now. <laughs> Hi, so I'm Janice and um, I'm now living in the desert in California. Um, I have a little garage dojo um, to try to offer some free, just collaborative Aikido, but I'm training at a dojo down in Palm Springs, which oh, is a beer and Kai dojo, although I'm not a member of beer and Kai. I was with the USAF for basically my whole Aikido career for the past 30 some years. Um, I left after uh, fallout from the, petition for gender equity. And since then, I've really thought a lot about, I wasn't thinking in terms of green and red flags, but that's what I was thinking about. What makes a healthy dojo? What, you know, what can you watch, what, what can you look out for? What are the, the systems which make things sometimes become toxic? And, you know, today, this is not at all about naming names. Um, I, you know, I hope people can tell stories and flesh out their ideas, but there's going to be no, you know, like name calling or, you know, this is not to call it individual dojos. This is really to move forward the future, to look at what we've learned and make things healthier from here on. Um, and all these flags that we're saying, we're, we're going to take them one by one and, and discuss them because pretty much every flag, you know, that's green has a red flip and a yellow flip. So, you know, my yellow flag um, that I always want to put out there for now is for, I guess I say free labor. I mean, um, I think it's all wonderful when people are washing the mat together and that would be a green, it's collaborative nature. On the other hand, some of it turns to red when people are really um, expected to give just too much, but then what's too much? So we'll have a discussion on all of these flags that we've had. Okay, so we hope that from this introduction, your wheels are turning. You probably came with some thoughts yourself. That's a part of why you're here. And so we'll get to that. Right now, I just want to introduce uh, Tamea, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, 
kind of um, putting your camera on again. So uh, the reason I want to introduce Tamea yep. is that she is a dojo show in Ushgorod, Ukraine. It's in the western part of Ukraine. Oh, there we go. And Sergey, her husband, oh, the two of them. <laughs> Hello. Um, Hello. I'll say I'll say something and maybe ask you to say something. Um, so they're in again western Ukraine, and I was fortunate to be there a couple months ago with them. <laughs> Um, and okay. what I want to say is a couple things and, and have them share about dojos there because um, I did a seminar. They had 200 kids and teens and adults on the mat. Can you imagine that? <laughs> Their dojos are very healthy. They're very robust. They're one of at least uh, four or five, six uh, very healthy dojos in Ushgorod. Uh, so a lot of people are training and we can ask them how that's happening. Something that I saw, a couple things I saw when I was there. One, there's just so much joy and love. Aikido is really helping in the midst of war, helping people, adults and kids to feel normal, healthy, uh, to have community, to network, to find resources that they need uh, in their lives. And there's just so much support in the practice itself, the principles and, and um, practices of Aikido. And to Lisa's point about joy, um, uh, Misha Sensei, who came from Kiev, who's I think head of the uh, Aikido Ukraine Association, uh, his wife and two daughters have been in Finland since the start of the war. His brother was fighting in Bakhmut. He's very involved with the war efforts. and. He said, oh my God, I forgot. Uh, when we were training with all the kids and all, he said, I forgot that I could be happy. I, could for I forgot that I could smile. I forgot that I could feel human. I could feel so good. So, um, you know, we're talking uh, very real situations in terms of, you know, the, the, the whole war and um, being displaced, how important Aikido is and how important it is to have... Um, you know, healthy practice. So welcome to Maya and Sergei Sensei. I honor you. Hi. And if you could share with us um, something about your dojo, I know you, you know, you're facing things that everybody's faced, uh, COVID and uh, membership, building, building your classes, uh, being able to sustain financially. So anything you could share would be really, really lovely. And I'm so happy to see you. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> today we have a seminar. No, yes, we have a seminar uh, now for, for Jodo. Uh, and uh, this uh, art with stick, not Judo, Jodo. And uh, we do one of those three disciplines we are practicing in our dojo. Uh, another two is Aikido and Yaido Kenjutsu. I do Kenjutsu like, like one. So uh, we have several groups, uh, different ages from uh, a very small one and to, to adults. So we try to practice with all of them, <laughs> try to adapt all uh, by the uh, to the level. So that's it, I think. Thank you. So yeah, he's saying that uh, they their Aikido is really filled out with their Joe and Iido practice as well. Uh, it's it's really something to see their students and from small. I mean, you know, kids are are doing amazing things. It's a very rich Aikido practice. Tamea, uh, sorry to put you guys on the spot, and uh, also English is, you know, not not the easiest thing. But thank you. Uh, this weekend we have a Jodo seminar of a teacher from uh, Czech Republic come, Patrick Orson say. So we have now a good time with friends <laughs> sitting. Yeah. <laughs> so different people uh, come from uh, Kiev, Zaporizhia to practice together this weekend. Uh, uh, different uh, parts of Ukraine here now, people.
So uh, I think one of the key things that I see, and uh, I think we've all felt this in our own communities, is that there's community. There's a real sense of friendship and a real sense of support and a real sense of joy and uh, outside of the dojo as well, going out to eat, uh, helping each other, supporting each other in, in each other's lives. So that's very strongly going on in, in Ukraine. So thank you. Great to see you. Enjoy. Good food there too, I must say. <laughs> okay, so um, um, who would like to maybe pop in, join in the conversation if you have some thoughts to share about anything that's been said so far uh, or something that you would like to share, concerns that you want to raise or uh, best practices, things that really have worked or are working for you as, uh, to, as a student. You may be a sensei, you may be a dojo cho. I think we're all students. And so we all have felt what it's like to, to train and what's been what's positive in Aikido tradition uh, and in, in what goes on in your dojo or in your organization. I think we need to think about seminars as well because sometimes people have a harder time in seminars. You might get injured. Uh, you might feel not part of, you might really feel the effects of in crowd and out crowd. So. I just want to open the floor. Anybody would like to share? Yeah. If someone has a, a flag they would like to discuss, they could put it in the chat and they will come to them one at a time and, and discuss each flag. Great. Thank you. Do you want to start out with a nice juicy yellow flag? How about if we talk about the idea of work doing work in the dojo. Cause I've had, you know, some students come in with the attitude that we're paying our money. We should come into a clean dojo and not be expected to clean it. Um, and, you know, there's something to be said for that. It's not the tradition I've been brought up in. I really think it's really nice when everyone, the students are part of the dojo and participating in cleaning the mat and taking responsibility um, for that. On the other hand, um, you know, people are paying money and it's who does the work doesn't get equally divided and it gets it gets sticky. So even though the, what feels natural to me is that we should be helping. I mean, I think taking a fresh look and saying, well, just because we've done it doesn't mean is that really healthy? Um, I tend to look and still think it is, <laughs> okay. Um, but I see other dojos where people are doing extensive carpentry say, or doing the bookkeeping and really professional valuable services and, you know, in a way, especially in a smaller dojo or one that's not reaping in the money, I mean, it takes the members to keep the dojo alive and, and people voluntarily participating. I think it'd be good, but voluntary is a funny thing, especially when we get into a culture where there isn't consent for anything. So um, anyway, I think the people have things they'd like to say about that. I'm just, cause it's all sides. Anyone from the, anyone here? Uh, yeah, yeah, raise your hand uh, in the chat or, um, yeah, where's- yeah, You can do this too. <laughs> yeah, Janet, reacting. saw your hand go up. But I, I just want to say, I think, I you know, expecting students to help care for the dojo, that's a nice Japanese tradition that I think can be done with, in a non-abusive way. But I think when it comes to doing work or personal care for the teacher, then it gets, I mean, again, that can be a Japanese tradition in the Uchideshi mode, but I think especially in a Western context, that can get abusive and a red flag really fast. So I don't know how people feel about that. Jen, I saw your hand up. Uh, yeah, I had a couple of thoughts about that. Um, a word that comes to mind when we're talking about um, like contributions, free labor and um, volunteering which is also a way of creating community. So there's always a balance with these things. Um, but I think one of the things that resolves um, the idea of people being taken advantage of in that situation is a transparency across the board about, especially in a giving kind of, or a nonprofit dojo, um, where what people are being paid for is available for members to see. 
um, where you have a board of directors. And I, I don't know to what degree I think that's true, but I think when you look at where labor is happening and where people are being paid, it's really good to just have kind of open, some open books on that, some transparency. And I appreciate the mystique of Aikido and the sense of surrender. I've been doing Aikido for 30 something years and the sense of surrender around it, but there's some things that should not be mysterious. And that's voting and who's in charge and what the power structures looks like and what the money looks like and where it's going and who's getting paid. And it should just be really simple, easy to see things. And I think that resolves um, some of the underlying um, issues that might arise on that level. So I just wanna say that. And then the second thought I had is, you know, I do agree that students who come in, um, and don't feel that they're paying for a space. You know, I, I also do sword work and Aikido work. And in the sword work, the philosophy is, you know, charge them a lot, it should hurt. They should want to be here. <laughs> That's kind of the underlying philosophy, which is slightly different. Um, but I think, you know, Aikido is at a very low price point for the level of professionalism and access and value that people are getting from it if you look at anything else. And so if that's your attitude, I think you could be expected to pay more somehow. Like there's a balance there. I don't mean people that don't contribute should pay more, but it's just a way of looking at the value of what people are getting and what they're bringing. So those are my thoughts. Oh, I would Great, love to. I would love to see you back on that, Jen. That was amazing. Yeah, um, a lot of really good good stuff there. Guy's got his hand up. Oh Guy, yeah, gee, I'm sure it's, yeah. Guy or Guy, I answered to both. Depends <laughs> on what country you're in. <laughs> um, so I, 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 I'm a sociologist. Sorry, I, you you weren't forewarned. I don't come with a warning label. Um. A lot of the stuff that I've seen in dojos and a lot of stuff I've heard you guys talking about is um, unexplained or unvisualized uh, or social norms. And that one of the green flags in a dojo is when you can come into it and ask people, hey, what are the social norms here? Now, most people not being sociologists might not ask that question directly, but when you walk in and you say, hey, wow, everybody seems to do something after class. What is it? And, and somebody explains Misogi to you and that it's part of the thing. Um, we recently worked on a handbook that we're going to release at Aikido of Berkeley. And that handbook, although half of it is what the test requirements are, the other half of it is basically surfacing the social norms of our dojo why we do misogi, why we call our sensei sensei on the mat, what uh, what happens when you're asked to take demonstration ukemi. Um, and, and there's a lot of things in there. Um, some of the things that are less well stated at other dojos that I've been at too are what are the relationship social norms? Um, are we going into a place that's an absolute tyrannical dictatorship um, where the the sensei has the power of life and death over the community and over the individuals in it um, or have we come to some place where yes this is a combination business community but the sensei really wants to be in a, a relationship with the student and that relationship is one of growth uh, and healing on both sides um, some of those social norms need to be stated what much, much more clearly in the Western world, because we don't have a history of the Japanese ideas of how this works. And I would even say from all of the stories I've heard from all of the people that have Uchi Deshis in Japan, they don't social, their social norms that we think in the Western world are so clearly delineated are not. Um, and so that worldwide, pretty much, I think we need to surface our social norms at our dojos. What do we expect of new people? And we need to tell the new people in simple, straight up language, this is what the social norms of this space are. It's a dojo. It's a path. It's a higher path. It's a place for us to practice a higher path. What does that look like? You're expected to help clean because it's a communal space. You're expected to train with people because that's how we learn Aikido. You're 
expect it also that if you get in a position where you don't feel comfortable, you're expected to say the word no or stop or or whatever those words or things are. Those social norms need to be clearly stated on both sides so that there's an understanding. If someone comes in and they don't understand it in the middle of someone throwing them, they can say, hey, stop, I don't know how to take break balls. Mm -hmm. They're liable not to use that social norm that they need to feel comfortable. Sociologist Thank off. <laughs> Thank you. Those are some really great thoughts. Just one second. I just wanted to kind of um, back up or, or kind of say something to uh, emphasize what Ari was mentioning about can you say yes or no? Where what are the borders or can you put up your own boundaries? And I love what you said about being explicit on the social norms in the dojo so that people have an idea. I mean, I know I kind of walked in, I'm young, I'm new, I don't know anything about this. And we give ourselves over so much to the training, to the experience, to the sensei, and I'm just kind of, yeah, yeah, um, and things maybe, but there's no way to say uh, when you're feeling uncomfortable if something doesn't really feel quite right. And I think having, for me, a big green flag is that it's okay to speak up, it's okay to put up some boundaries and it's helpful to know what are the limits. Also, Jen, what you have said, you used the word balance. What's the balance? And if things are starting to feel out of balance, given too much, you're volunteering too much, what, you know, where we can feel balanced. Lisa, I saw your hand up. Yeah, first I wanna thank the organizers for, for organizing this event. I think it's a good thing. Um, and I just want to say that in my dojo, as far as being of service and work, and not just in my dojo, but in my organization as well, cleaning after training, getting the dojo ready before training at a seminar, setting for the seminar, cleaning after seminar, that's part of training. But carpentry type work, accounting type work, that's above and beyond. And as far as cleaning goes and setting the dojo, caring for the space in that way on our daily stuff, I do it too. And for me, a red flag is where certain people don't. I don't do that stuff, the underlings do it. That's, that's a red flag for me. But for the green flag, I do it too. I'm not gonna ask anybody to clean the bathroom if I'm not willing, shit. I get in the bathroom first and clean it. Now that's what I think is, uh, for me, that's my training too. I'm never above my own training. And as far as the above and beyond the daily part of our training, cleaning and caring for the space, if there's carpentry, if there's accounting, if there's you know, anything extra, working on the website, anything like that, I always offer to pay somebody for their services. And I, I think that's reasonable. And I, I think that it's, I think it's a very slippery slope or dangerous position for someone in charge of a dojo or an organization, people wanted to take advantage of people like that. It would be very easy to just tell, you know, I, I, I want you to do this and take advantage of them. So that's something I think, I think it's on, I think a lot of this red flag, green flag, yellow flag stuff is on the person at the top to set the standard, to be clear, to be transparent, to be clear about the, the accepted social norms and to be fair about that all too. So as far as work, working for and in the dojo, that's kind of what I want to contribute. Thank you. Great, thank you. Anybody else? So one thing I just, while we're on this topic, I love all of these comments about this, you know, red, yellow, green flag. Um, yeah, the transparency, the clarity of communication, and Lisa talking about, you know, the, the person, the pe person or people at the top should be modeling, really. Um, but one thing that I haven't heard mentioned, which I think is really critical on this topic, is the question of financial privilege and how these expectations can hugely impact who is able to train and thrive in a dojo. Um, you know, already people have to have disposable income and disposable time in order to practice for the most part. And then if they're expected to offer more time or resources, that limits even further who has those resources to be able to be part of these communities. And it, it, it minimizes diversity is I think a huge problem. Thank you. Uh, Mary, I think you had your hand up. 
And then Leo. I do. Thank you for calling me. I'm Mary Eastland. I practice Aikido at Berkshire Hill Aikido in Mass. And we have been around for 20 years. Yesterday, we left Koki Kai and formed Berkshire Hills Aikido. We're an American dojo and we're small, but we practiced all through um, COVID on Zoom and our dojo's thriving. And I'm very grateful for that. And I was, I've been thinking about all the different things I've been talking about. You know, we do ask people pay dues, but if they can't, they can train anyway. They're very welcome. And since my dojo is at my house, we have a, a beautiful dojo right at my house. I clean it and I wouldn't imagine anyone to clean it for me that would just be weird um and we all you know we do all our computer work and stuff and um I, I, it's interesting one of the reasons why I wanted my husband to leave the dojo I mean the organization that we were at like um seven years before we left was because of the misunderstandings and the um the hierarchy you know of people expecting uh somebody go get their lunch because they were a black belt, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, that's just a, and also um, the, the, da, the Japanese mores that I just didn't agree with where women are second. And so um, I was very happy when we finally left, I would have left a bit sooner because of, you know, but I had to continue to practice. There's not a lot of Aikido in my town and I am married to my sensei. One of the cool things about that Ron and I teach every class together and we both we take Ukemi still, even though he's 76 and I'm 60. I think that's a very important example to provide our students because Aikido is keeping us young. Why not show people that way? And also it's a measure of humility to take Ukemi when you are, you know, Ron is, is my teacher for 10 years ahead of me and he accepts correction from me. And I think that's a really, really powerful example for our students. So I just wanted to weigh in here and thank you all for this forum and um, just glad to be here. Thank you so much. Really interesting. Good to hear. Um, I, I want to say something about fitness, but let's hear from Leo. Oh, uh, yeah, I was going to, wait, you guys can hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I was going to prop up one of my own sort of yellow flags, let's say, that I sort of. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, this one is kind of, it kind of sounds contrarian, but I feel it's kind, kind of, important is this idea of like a community which puts too much forward this idea of we're all friends here and I can sort of I feel that to be for me it's quite like quite a bit of yellow flag you know almost like a red flag because in certain sense it's quite good you're welcoming but then the idea is that in reality not everybody is a friend and in these communities which everybody is a friend if somebody is not a friend you know quote unquote uh it becomes even harder to, to deal with that because let's say there's some kind of victimization and then, but the idea is like in these communities, which everybody's a friend some victims will come into the community and it can be very good for them and healthy for them. And they'll see this person who is now victimized within the community as being like an opposite, like a hostile person because they're threatening the friendliness of the community. And I, I don't know for my, so it, it sort of creates conflict almost because like victims can are becoming like the aggressors in these communities, let's say, because they're questioning their friendliness. And it's, it's, it's an Aikido and also like, I, like in, in other sort of movement oriented communities, I sort of felt this and, you know, I, I don't know. That's, uh, I'm interested in hearing comments on that. I just want to say, I think that's really interesting. We were discussing my green flag about joy and happiness and how that can also be a weird culty we all are so happy you know you must be happy turn that frown yeah. upside down you know so again i think that's a really interesting point you know friendliness that's a little oppressive is interesting uh, sorry go yeah. ahead neilu did you want to yeah neilu did you have a comment uh um I wanted to refer to something in the chat early on about what what are we saying no to and an example for me um, was when I was first uh, learning Ukemi and, and I was, you know, starting to be ready to be breakfall, my, ch my chief instructor said, you know, do you want me to throw you into a breakfall? And I said, no, I did not feel ready. And that teacher did throw me into a breakfall. So um, just as 
I wanted to give a, a concrete example because um, someone was asking that early on. Um, and that, if I knew at the time, you know, that would have been a red flag. Um, and since I'm so public with my story, that did end up being the same person that sexually assaulted me. So you can connect all those dots if you want. Um, and so, yeah, it's just something really hard uh, to look back at and to kind of break down the signs. Um, I do feel very targeted in the Aikido communities as a person of color. Um, I have my own cultural background being Iranian and all those things. I, I did feel targeted when I look back at my, at my past. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, this notion of we want Dojo say to be warm, welcoming, supportive, at the same time, what's too friendly, and to be, to put those norms out there, um, and to say that, you know, we want to be respectful of each other's bodies, of each other's space, of each other's person and self, um, and, you know, the, the lines aren't always completely clear and they can be different for different people but that you know there are certain lines that can't be crossed um and that, that those things need to be put out there jen i think you had your hand up uh yes um i had a couple of thoughts i wanted to um respond to leo's comment of um about people being friends and um i think that that's a really salient um thing to pursue in our own considerations as we go forward in that one of the things I learned and loved in Aikido and continue to learn is, is actually neutrality rather than being a friend or these kind of identifications of relationship, but more a neutrality and an ability to whether I like someone or not, or whether we jive or not, I can still be with them and be whole and give them the space to be whole and move neutrally in wholeness through the world, no matter how it works out. And the dojo is a really great place for doing that because when we're focusing on technique and when we're focusing on ourselves in a whole way and embodying that we are really giving the best of ourselves, no matter what happens to be across our face or no matter how, much I hang out with this person or not. I mean, that's all icing on the cake, but the cake is really, for me, is a neutrality. And um, so that means that somebody that's really, I might perceive otherwise is awful. I can still be whole near them while identifying that and moving fully. And, and, and as well as somebody that I really admire who might have wonderful things to say about me that I really want to hear, you know, but in between all of those things is this neutrality and, and it's powerful. And for me, when I walk into a dojo and somebody was talking about the joy that comes out and I love that too, it's fantastic. But when I walk in and people have a clean intent focus that's settled, mm -hmm. that is a huge green flag for me. There's a calmness and an ease in the focus and the depth. And that's that's uh, something really powerful. So I just, I wanted to interject with that and uh, and say thank you for uh, hearing my comment. That brings up something really interesting for me. Um, and then Janice, I see your hand up. Um, and that is that I've always been fascinated by this. When you talk about neutrality, I think about being centered, right? We teach about being centered, grounded, empowered, clear, um, you know, in relationship, we bow in equally. And then all the whole rest of this, according to Japanese tradition, is this whole hierarchy, right? And you shut up and train, you don't get to open your mouth, you don't get to express your opinion, there's no real democracy and empowerment. And that contradiction, the tension between those things, it's like, uh, you know, we say there's the dojo and there's the world, but the dojo and the mat is the real world. And we are relating so intensively um, and intimately. And yet it's like, well, we're not supposed to practice those things here. We're just supposed to go, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so anyway, it's supposed to kind of toss that out. That has always been something that bothers me and, uh, you know, tried to uh, kind of deal with that uh, in, in my own dojo or in the way that I I conduct uh, classes or seminars, you know, so that it's empowering for everybody and we can speak up and we can interact and everyone is centered and grounded and powerful. Janice. Unmute, unmute. I'm sorry. I know there's a couple of people with their hands up. I'm going to get there in a second. I just want to say that so many of these things are so basic and they're so 
complicated and overlapping. And the idea of the flags was to kind of sort that out. Just like, um, you know, this seems contradictory. There's contradictory things. Smiling, is it good or is it bad? But how do you tell the difference? What are the lines to tell the difference between that culty smiling and then the joyous smiling? Um, so we're going to take all of all of these this input and try to compile a list of green, yellow, and red flags. Um, and then anyone who's interested, you know, could be, um, if you'd like to share in this process, let us know. Um, but in the comments, try to think in those terms um, so we get a little focus on things. Um, but it's one thing just leads into another. The, the work leads into the consent. And I mean, there's just so, all the issues are overlapping. So with that, let me just add the one thing when um, Lee was talking about everyone being friends. Another thing is, you know, I started with, thought it was very important that everyone practices with everybody. You don't say no, someone bows you, you say yes. And I think that's really important. I mean, because, you know, some people are more fun to train with, but I've learned so much from the ones who aren't so fun or are harder to train with or smell or whatever. You know, I think it's really good to practice with everyone, except if you feel unsafe, you should be allowed not to. So where's the thing? Practice everyone except if it's. Oh, she just went on mute, Janice. I don't think you meant to. Be there? Oh, was I? Yeah. When did I get muted? Was I muted the whole time? No, just the last couple oh. sentences. And my space bar unmuted it and then it stopped working for some reason. Um. Anyway, what was I saying? So I don't know where I was, but. um. Yeah, so so I think it should be very clearly laid out what are the expectations and and there's got to be some way of saying perhaps with everyone unless it's unsafe and it's, if it's unsafe something has to be done with that. Um, also, someone else had said about coming from the top and whenever we see a problem, it's always okay. What do you do with the problem with the dojo if it's the chief instructor? But it's always the chief instructor because if the chief instructor was you know wasn't a problem, they, <laughs> these things wouldn't be happening. So. Um, yeah, the chief instructor, I love what Guy said about having it very explicit. Um, and so, so all these things, the, the specific things like who trains with everybody, um, things to think about. So we're going to try to put that into flags and I've babbled enough. So who was I'd like to, uh, I'd like to invite people to share a red flag. Um, and Again, of course, watch your watch your tone, your length, and you know what you say. And uh, you know we're not doing this in any attacking kind of way, but just to reflect on uh, what has been uncomfortable for you, what what do you feel is unacceptable for you? Um, what's a red flag for you in a dojo or in a seminar? And what do you do when you're in that situation? Uh, I one thing I can think of is when my partner is telling me what to do. And I felt that way when I was a white belt. <laughs> I felt that way when I'm a black belt. <laughs> it's like, you know, um, it's one thing. How do we share? You know, how, how can we help each other? And then what's a way that really doesn't feel good? Um, so that's, and then maybe that's a yellow, I would say, because uh, it just kind of depends on how, how we communicate with each other and help each other. Because there's some ways that uh, I really don't appreciate. And then there's ways I really do appreciate. But uh, so that's just one, but I, I want to give us some space to maybe um, share a little bit more in the, the harder conversation part, as well as uh, the, the green flags. Anybody want to jump in? Uh, yeah, dive in there, jump in. Okay, guys, see your hand. And any of you who haven't spoken, I just want to really encourage you if you feel like it. Nobody's forced to, of course, um, but we want to hear from you if you care to, to share. Okay, so Guy. All right, so there's two of us here. You may have noticed this is <laughs> Hi, Melissa. Melissa. Okay, great. Hi. So go for it. Oh, um, well, I know Guy had something to say earlier, but I'm mean, just thinking about some of the red flags that we've seen for us. Um, one of the things we learned is sort of a red flag is if you have like a high number of Yudansha or higher ranking people that show up, train, and go immediately home. Now, recognizing that people are pressed for time sometimes, that if you have a high proportion of the community that shows up, trains, and disappears immediately afterwards, there's probably something funny going on. Um, you know, and and I know in, in our first dojo that um, the Masogi was used um, as a way to abuse us. You know, we, we learned, however, he wanted everything to be done. And once we all did it that way, then suddenly one day there would be a new system and you were all wrong. 
Um, consequently, I still have issues around Misogi. I'm perfectly willing to chip in and help, but I don't, I have really funny feelings about being assigned tasks and certain tasks are triggering to me um, in particular. Yeah, and uh, centralized communication systems in a hierarchy, mm -hmm. that they're what creates a hierarchy. And uh, if I go into a dojo and no one does anything or talks to each other except through the dojo cho, I'll be honest, I'm out. That's a ripcord moment. Um, having lived through that where the community wasn't allowed to develop and there were no communications that were allowed to take place that weren't subject to the overview of the dojo cho. Um, we could get in trouble for meeting up for coffee outside the dojo. Yeah. Was... Um, they wanted to know what kind of conversations were happening in the ladies' dressing room. Hello? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so just those are some red flags that, that we've run into. I like that. That's a ripcord moment. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Lisa, your hands up. Um, maybe you're not seeing others. If I miss yeah, you. Um, something okay. that the, the dojo I first came up in, um, people were not allowed to ask questions. People were scurrying around and grabbing shoes and bowing and grabbing bags out of fear because you'd be in trouble. And nobody, nobody knew why you were grabbing shoes. Why, oh, why, am I, why am I bowing at this time this way? I asked and I was told because we're supposed to. And one time I asked my teacher why I don't even remember the technique, but I asked, why do we move this way? And I wasn't being confrontational. I truly wanted to understand. And he slapped me across the face and said, you know, ask me why. And I decided right then, I was never gonna ask that person why again, but I continued to think why about different things. And I think it's important, that's a red flag, a huge red flag. And the scurrying around and not, doing things out of fear is a huge red flag. When I went to Japan and I spent a number of years there, my etiquette was really good, but it was only from being in a different environment than that env environment that I learned to move out of fear it was by being in a different environment that I learned to move from my heart. And I think it's really important that people don't move from fear and people are empowered and encouraged to ask questions. Um, as far as the, um, and that, that first dojo I was in, the teacher would demonstrate and we all screw up. I screw up all the time. I'm teaching, I'm demonstrating techniques. I screw up all the time. But um, when that teacher would flub, the re the, what that teacher would do is like this to the UK. <laughs> and imply that it was the UK who had screwed up. And so I think for me, that's another red flag of a teacher who cannot admit that they also, or a hierarchy where the people on top set themselves up as perfect and present themselves as being infallible. I think that's, a, for me, that does not work as a way to teach or a way to receive teaching. Um, a question I always ask myself, as a teacher or as an organization head, is, is it good for the student or the members? Is it good for the dojo or the organization? Is it good for the art? And for me, those, those are the, that's what comes first. It's never about, is it good for me? It's good for the student, is it good for the dojo, is it good for the art? And that helps me learn how to move. I screw up, I still screw up all the time, but I'm trying, you know, so. Thank you. Some good guidelines. Um, Leo and Vivian, um, I think you had your hands up and Amelia's asked a really great question. I think we could have some good discussion about. So Leo and then Vivian. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. One of mine is, um, I say, consistency and in, inconsistencies in the roughness. So like if the person is projecting a very nice appeal, well, then the technique should be very nice. But then if the person, person's projecting sort of clothes and much more hardness, then, then that's in that case where the throws can be hard. And then the idea is like, if you throw me hard, give me the opportunity to throw you hard. But it's just like, 
you make you're making me break fall and then you're retreating off of your attack that's a for me it's a very major riff, like red flag like roughness is okay I, I i totally fine i think it's okay but it should be like consistent predictable you know and mutual like if you if you make me break fall you have to be taking the break fall if you're not taking break fall you don't make me do break falls you know and stuff like that so that's a good point about um level of intensity it could be pace intensity of training and is there a sensitivity and, and a consent and, and a balance there so yeah thank you leo vivian welcome where are you where are you from i don't I haven't met you before unmute unmute okay can you hear me now yes so sorry um, I'm in Washington, D.C., and I hope it's okay for me to <laughs> speak up um, because I actually haven't been doing Aikido for about six years because of a concussion from Aikido. Um, wow. An instructor threw me on my head during a test. I was taking Ukemi. Um, so that's a red flag. <laughs> That's what we're talking about. Thank you for sharing. Go ahead. Yeah. And so this is, I tried for a year after that. I, you know, I had some recovery time and then I went back and tried different dojo in the area. Um, and ultimately I couldn't make it work. I, I couldn't find a way to feel safe to practice and not feel like I was risking, you know, more brain injury. Um, I would say a red flag that comes up is if there are not a lot of long timers at a dojo, but that is hard to see when you first show up at a dojo. I think it's interesting that the dojo where I received the concussion, um, there were only a few people who had been there for longer than let's say three or four years. Um, people would get their first degree and then there weren't a lot of senior, senior black belts. I think there are a little more now, but I also found out after my concussion that I stayed in touch with other people from the dojo. And then I would meet people who had stopped coming to the dojo and they were all, all women and they were like, oh, I quit because I had a concussion or I had a, I broke my collarbone. Oh, I, or I, you know, was hurt in a, in a way that was leading to chronic pain or, or they didn't want to have that injury again. Um, the flip side of that is a green flag for me was one of the dojo that I went to afterwards had in a very prominent place it's it was a sign that said if you have any issues with your instructor or the way that this dojo is run here are the contact numbers for the board members and here is how you uh reach out to them so i thought that was a really um professional and reassuring uh sign about that dojo Well, first of all, thank you for sharing. And I think we all are just like, ah, <laughs> like red flag, hands on fire, like, ah, injury, uh, carelessness, and like a, a sensei ends up crashing your head and like you've stopped Aikido because of a brain injury. Um, and there's no just, follow up that, you know, they didn't come back and say, are you okay now? Or, are you, you know, I mean, socially, I kept up with some people, but the dojo did not reach out and say, hey, you know, what's going on now? Mm. Yeah, um, it's actually reminding me, you probably don't know, but I think that was, uh, it was the day of my sanda, and I just got my sanda, and they were doing uh, tests in Bay Area White. It was a lot of people there, and there was a guy doing a shodan, and the, all the senseis uh, were calling in some different ukes just to add to the test, right? Uh, work with someone who you're not necessarily so prepared with. And they called me in and uh, this guy did not like 
me, challenging him a little bit more. And he threw me in a break fall, except that he did it about this far from the mat. He did it on purpose, didn't give me any room to roll. And I crashed on my shoulder, my neck went over there. This was a more than a year injury. Um, I separated my shoulder really, really badly. It's the worst injury uh, I think that I've had. And it was a real trauma. Um, I, I think they didn't pass him. <laughs> As I recall, I was in so much pain, I don't remember. But you know, when, when things like that happen and, it, and people see it or it happens from the sensei, it's like, where do we go? What can we say? And there should be care. There should be care and responsibility taking uh, from, from those sorts of experiences. So, and I, I'm sure that there are too many examples of physical as well as uh, sexual abuse, uh, harassment, abuse. There's a really good question. Amelia, would you um, talk about the question that you've raised? I think it's a really important topic. You're on mute. Still on mute. Looks like she's having a little technical difficulty. Um, Ari or um, Lisa, would somebody? Um, yeah, she, she had mentioned that. Yeah, thank um, you. Yeah, in the dojo, there were um, a lot of men being promoted and women being held back or, you know, just seeming to take a lot of time to be promoted. And I think that's a great subject of, you know, and what Guy mentioned about lack of transparency. A lot of dojos just have a, a complete lack of transparency around promotion, promotion opportunities, promotion requirements. I mean, there are technical requirements, but a lot of teachers not a lot, but some teachers do go beyond that and, and you know, ho hold people back for decades at a time. So I think that's really good yellow, green, yellow, red flag is, you know, you, you people aren't getting promoted. People are hanging out for decades, not getting promoted. That's weird in my book. But I, yeah, I just want to mention quickly, I love that idea of a sign with contact people. I think that's a really excellent um, uh, thing to do, give people another place to go. But I also also wanted to say that uh, one of my red flags is seeing a lot of signs in a dojo. Like I remember one dojo on the West Coast where they had a sign in the bathroom: "Don't use too much um, paper towels. Don't don't use too many. Don't use too much toilet paper." It was like every, there was a sign on every square inch of the dojo, and to me that said this is a a a, a really controlling community and b uh, a really you know community that doesn't communicate. So for me, if I go in a dojo and I see a sign like, please wipe your ass, I'm like, oh, okay. It's not the dojo for me. But, all right, sorry, Amelia, you're back. Can Amelia, you I think you're back. Yay, we can hear you. Yes, I'm back and the audio is working. Excellent, thank you. <laughs> um, Laura's no, yours. So actually, Neela's story about being thrown in a break fall when she'd asked not to be reminded me of something that happened at the very beginning of my training where about just a couple of weeks in, I was shown how to do a break fall out of a Kochinage. And then a little time went by and then I was told I wasn't ready to do break falls. And I went away for a little bit because um, I was on a trip and I came back and somebody who had just started training was doing break falls where I had been training for like six months and was told I wasn't ready. And it was driving, it drove me crazy. And so it's there's a there's a question of like not just like pushing people beyond where they can go physically, but a sense of being over cautious because they're you know afraid of and then that leads to holding it went in this case with holding people back from testing where somebody wouldn't test for um, you know much longer than is customary. And it, it's just, it's not like, it's not as, it's in some ways, it's not as bad. In some ways, I feel like it's a yellow flag kind of thing. It's not out of ill will, but it's, it's not great either. <laughs> to me, it's kind of bringing up a, a whole big topic that we might call power and power abuse. <clears throat> and 
actually in 1998, I was part of co-founding an organization that's going strong. We're in our 25th year, I think, uh, called the Association of Women Martial Arts Instructors. And this is to your point about, um, let's say, women being held back. One of the things that the organization does, and we have an annual Teaching the Teacher Conference, and we heard in across martial arts, not just Aikido, but across martial arts, that women, there were too many instances of women being abused um, and in physically and sexually, and also being held back from promotions. Um, and that this was, it, it, and they were out, you know? <laughs> it was like either put up with this or they wanted to keep training, but they, they didn't feel safe training where they were and they felt that they'd hit a dead end, they were stuck. And so we created a rank promotion opportunity, uh, very rigorous. It's not like we're just handing out ranks, but you know, it's rigorous, but there, we wanted to create another way for women who got stuck for these kinds of reasons to be able to continue to train, to train safely and to continue to have the uh, rank advancement possibilities. And it, not only women have had that experience, I will say that men have for not towing the line or whatever, they didn't do this X, Y, or Z. And so the power abuse is that you can get punished as a student for not doing X, Y, or Z. And that for me, that's a red flag. You yeah. also want to chime in on this? We should get some of the people who still have their hands up, who, who is still here. Um, that somebody Wait, is... Just uh, unmute yourself if we haven't gotten to or don't see you. Please speak up. Feel speak free. Up. Laura, you had your hand up a while ago. Do you still want to? And David Norton, I think. I'll go. Great, thank you. I actually had to uh, go find the original post from, I think it was Me Too Aikido to, because as soon as I saw that post about flags, I, I wrote way too much. Uh, I won't read everything I read, just a couple of them. By the way, my name's Dave Norton. Um, I practiced on Long Island with Eddie Hagihara, uh, moved down to Maryland in 2011, opened a dojo in 2013, and despite COVID, still teaching. Um, so my, let's pick the my favorite green flag. Um, when you go to a dojo and they're more interested in you than your money, I take that as a good sign because um, everyone is interested in money and it's good if they like you as well. Um, for yellow flags, let me give a good one. Um, you're not allowed to speak directly to the sensei. He's very important and can't speak to a low life, you know, white belt like yourself. Um, and it's a him. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Of, of course it would be a him. There's no women teachers. That's kooky talk. Um, and I just sat, found my video froze. It does that whenever I talk. I think my computer is telling me something. Um, and my there's a few red flags I have, but one uh, I want to. Other people have said some things. I think I forget who it was. So many new names. Somebody talked about you can't certain things you can't speak about. I'm in agreement with that. But one for me uh, is one that I've know a little bit about, read a little bit about is anything that is in sync with the signs of cult behavior. Because cults are dangerous and bad. And if your dojo is showing or if a dojo you're interested in is showing signs of cult behavior, I think that's a pretty big red flag. And look up cults if if you if people are not familiar with it, if you only know it from a just a general parlance cults are very very specific it has to do with a, a leader who cannot be questioned um a lot of brainwashing techniques and things like that but yeah that's a very dangerous thing because dojos can be i think susceptible to cult-like behavior that that 
we are we are one and we are going to move in a direction this is what we do we do this we do not do that and if you want to be part of us you will go along with that so that's all i got i'll mute myself at that's awesome thank you so my first the first dojo i started at not only was it a culture of fear and dysfunction um, but it was also abusive senior people hurt junior people and everybody laughed about it and a lot of people quit and the teacher was a sexual predator and he tried his he, tried, he hit on me and i said no and then i was i became invisible for 2 years he ignored me completely which meant everybody else ignored me because they'd be in trouble if, you know, I was like a leper, they'd be lepers too. And I wasn't permitted to test, even though I trained a lot. And one day I got called into his office and he said to me, you know, nice to me, you know, oh, he, he, I got to test and he called me into the office after the test because I failed it. And he said, you know, nice to me, you know, pass. So that was a huge awakening for me. And it made me realize a lot of the stuff, a lot of the dysfunctional stuff that was going on there was just not good. And I said, thank you, Sensei. And he said, what? And I said, thank you. And I came to a point where I was this close to quitting Aikido, but decided I was gonna go to Japan and see, and if it was as dysfunctional there as it was at that place, then I would quit. But I wasn't gonna let this person and this environment take something that I had read about being so wonderful. I wasn't going to let it just take, let them take it away from me. So I went to Japan and in retrospect, it was a wonderful, most wonderful thing in my life. But what I decided, what do I do? What is my responsibility to the art? And my, I decided when Doshu told me, go make a dojo in Chicago. I mean, the only answer is yes, Sensei. And I decided that because there was a question in the, flat, in the chat about what do we do about these red flags? We create environments where they can't live. We don't feed them. We don't allow them to continue. We use our feet and we leave those dojos and we create safe spaces that are healthy instead of supporting the dysfunctional ones. We find like-minded people to be in our own dojo to train or to have dojo, dojo, dojo band together and support each other in healthy environments. And not only is this going to be good for the people training, but this is how we ensure the future of Aikido is by keeping it, by making it healthier and keeping it healthy. So that's what I try to do. And I am not perfect by any means, but I'm so grateful. I have people around me that tell me when I'm acting like an ass or, you know, I mean, I've never indulged in some of those behaviors. That's not something I would never do. But, you know, just bad decisions, sometimes we all make them. But I try to create a different environment than what I came up in. And that's, I think, how we deal with the red flags. In general, one of the things that uh, somebody asked about COVID, Jerry, um, how are dojos doing since COVID and all. And one of the things that we, as the Aikido Solstice Seminars Committee and how this whole thing got started at the beginning of the pandemic was to say, hey, the pandemic has given us an opportunity to train a little bit differently and to step back from the hierarchy and powers that be kind of dictating things. And we, uh, in our first, in our seminars, we've tried to um, kind of lower the emphasis on rank, be sure that we have variety, um, in, you know, diversity in our instructors uh, without, uh, and that, that's by age, that's by um, ethnicity, that's by geography, you know, but, but to, to build in more diversity and more uh, equality and respect and sharing and uh, training across borders, across borders of our, um, you know, of our communities and our organizations and styles and ranks and, you know, all this sort of thing um, to hold difficult discussions, to have a conversation like this. This isn't something that, that typically goes on in the, you know, sort of Aikido world as, as we, we got it, you know, years ago. Um, and we've addressed Aikido and race, Aikido, um, 
uh, as uh, when, when protest and you know process all these kinds of issues. Um, so I think that that's part of starting to really create change in the Aikido, Aikido community and to make our dojos and our training more what we really want it to be. Um, yeah. Um, so and and that, and that I, COVID is really, uh, I just to finish this one thought, Jerry, that uh, COVID is, okay. I think, in coming back from COVID is really been an opportunity to reevaluate and to make changes because we were just kind of going on, right? The whole world was just doing what it was doing. And I, COVID has been an opportunity. And as we do come back, we have an opportunity to reinvent and remake uh, things more uh, healthier the way that we feel is more more functional yeah so my question was what's your sense of the percentage of dojos that did close during covid have reopened i don't know and i don't know if we have any statistics on that or who's <clears throat> who's keeping those statistics i think for this conversation the really important point is how can we use COVID as a, and the reopening of dojos as a, an opportunity to, to make changes, basically, mm -hmm. to make changes, to carry on uh, the traditions and, and the ways that feel healthy, and then to make some changes that maybe have been long overdue. So you don't want to guess at that question? Not really. I, I'm, I'm not, I don't know if anybody okay. has any I would love for us to stay on topic, actually. Um, yeah. And I would love to dovetail off of what Jamie was talking about, about COVID, about making changes. One thing that I'm feeling as we near the end, I'm actually feeling really uncomfortable with is that um, we haven't really dived into the red flag of lack of diversity in dojos. Um, and I think in terms of what Jamie was talking about, you know, reopening dojos or re-energizing them, you know, it's so important to keep that in mind, to keep in mind the racism, the classism, the sexism, the uh, ableism, you know, there, there's so many. Heterosexism. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, and there's a lot, it's a huge topic. There's so much to consider and so much to think about. It's something I think about a lot in my own dojo, which it, we're in a very, we're in upstate New York. We're in a very overwhelmingly white area and my dojo is very overwhelmingly white. And I'm really aware that for a person of color walking into my dojo, that is very possibly a big red flag. Um, and that's a concern and something that I am really interested in you know, thinking about and working on moving forward. Uh, I'd, I'd like to jump into that. Uh real quickly because um, this isn't what I had my hand raised for, but I, I like this conversation. Um, actually, it's going to dovetail um, because um, I like the the huge quiet subject that I hold within me is the fact that I, I am alone in the dojo that I came up and under and that I helped to build and that I was a member of for many years. I've been training for 30 years. I'm not welcome in the doors of a dojo that many people actually hold up as a model of how to behave. And I am not alone. Um, and I won't name names, but it, I will tell you this is that I'm an extremely good person and I did nothing to deserve anything at all. And so the conversations about cultism and the conversations about how these things occur, they happen quietly, covertly behind the doors. These are not overt things, but you may end up participating in them if you're a senpai, for example, um, as I was asked to do, but refused to do, was to go hey, by the sensei, hey, I want you to go talk to this person for me and let them know, tell them this. And it was might have seemed benign to me, but to that problem person, it was probably incredibly triggering now that I know I'm on the other side of that. And so that, but so that's a big topic, and I think it needs to be covered tenderly over time. Um, but as far as diversity, what happened and what was fantastic about all that was already in the works is that I was involved in a project of going out like somebody had um, recruited me because of my teaching and my passion. I, I came up through alternative education. I'm a lower 
class person, a high class, low money, uh, you know, and um, so Aikido world was a step up in a certain way. Uh, but I ended up teaching and going out into the world, as it were, and setting up all these little satellite dojos in schools and in communities. And I mean, teaching my ass off, uh, I'm not, you know, you need friends to do these things. But by going out into diverse neighborhoods and diverse communities and setting up small programs, I was able to, and you know, and gratefully have somewhere to share Aikido, I was able to then make in you know relationships with all these other you know uh, diverse and neurodiverse and wonky people like myself and other people and I feel that that is a wonderful exploration of how to do that and then those people um, may come to your dojo and may bring friends with them and and uh, so I just I just want to share that and uh, thanks for the opportunity to express that idea. Jen, I, I just want to thank you for sharing that. And I feel very similar with the dojo I built in Brooklyn and would love to talk more at some point. Thank you for that share and, mm -hmm. and continuing to find ways to, to do Aikido, share Aikido and keep it and stay so passionate about it. So thank you. Mm -hmm. We only have uh, a couple minutes left. So is there anyone who hasn't spoken yet who has wants to offer up a flag? While you're thinking about that, I'll, I'll just say um, I have another topic, it's flag. Um, for me, it's a green flag if it's there and it's a red flag if it isn't. <laughs> and that's about fitness, warmups. So I, I came up in a you know long time ago, and we used to do five, six minutes, maybe sort of Japanese style warm ups. We go, <laughs> that was kind of it. And then we did what I call kamikaze ukemi and kamikaze aikido. <laughs> and you know, I was young, we were young, um, and we just threw ourselves and we said, throw me, throw me, and we did. And I did I think too many break falls? We didn't warm up our bodies enough. We didn't understand fitness and balance and uh, flexibility and strength and uh, many things we didn't quite understand. And how important fitness is to injury prevention and what I call peak performance. So for me, I've really tried to, I've pursued fitness and what I call body mind fitness in a big way and build that into Aikido. And I try to build in centering and grounding, all the breathing, all the things that we do when we train, right? When we start doing techniques to go, wait a minute, warm-ups is training and that it's important how we care for ourselves. Too many in my generation, too many people in my generation uh, we can't have become unable to take ukemi or uh, replacement of this or that. And I, kind of being like old football players. I was an old Aikido player in my 40s. I really had to rehab uh, in order to be and continue to have Aikido, to train and to have Aikido be something really healthy in my life. So I just wanted to put that out there because I feel that for me, that's uh, something I really look for in dojos and I try to bring to dojos when I um, visit many dojos is how important fitness is. And, I, and to, to help slightly older folks, to be able to train longer and to give younger folks some vision of that. Because, you know, when you're young, you don't necessarily understand um, and you can't imagine how you're going to feel later. And that it's really important. I think we need to take care of ourselves and also take care of the younger generation and that that's a way to do it. And that it, and to also relate our warm ups and our fitness to our training altogether. So I just wanted to put that out there. Anybody else, uh, if you want to speak, share something. I'd like please. to say something. Gi, I know you have your hand up, but but this is this is something I feel is really important. And Jamie, I'm not trying to come down on you, but you know, you said Japanese style dojos. I think that categorizing all Japanese dojos as the same style is dangerous, and it's quite similar to saying women are like this or you know gay people are like that and i think we really need to understand that every dojo um, is different and some may be similar but not all japanese i've been in a lot of japanese dojos. there's a lot of them 
even teachers at home for dojo, they don't just do this whirlwind warm up and five five seconds and you're done yeah, yeah. jump into that. So Point well taken. Ari Cowan. Yeah. It's yeah. really important to, to realize that every situation is different and not um, sort of make blanket statements like that. The point is, uh, I can take the Japanese out of it. Uh, the point is just that I think that it's important that we do more than um, just a, sort of a, a cursory kind of warm up. So yeah, thank you, you for that. that completely. Yeah, I agree okay, with you. Thank you. On that. Okay, anybody else? Some, this is awesome. And it has felt, <laughs> it has felt like being at um, kind of a 12-step program for people who have been abused in Aikido. Hi, my name's Guy. I had an abusive sensei. Hi, Guy. Right. Um, and that's good. And I'm not, I'm, I'm kind of making light of it, but that is very powerful. And that's something that we all need as people to, to hear other people's stories, to know that we're not alone. Because I know after I left my first dojo, uh, horrible amounts of guilt and shame for having been in an abusive relationship that wasn't of my creating. But the thing that I want us at some point to be able to touch on it, it might not be today, is what do we do? What do we do when we, if we find ourselves in a situation where these things are going on? All of these red flags, I'm, I'm reading in the comments uh, on the chat, and I just said to Melissa, this is our first dojo. This happened, this happened, this happened, this happened, this happened. It's like, it all happened in our first dojo. There were five waves of exodus at our first dojo before we got there. I'm a sociologist. I study the movement of communities. We got there and the same thing happened to us. And later on, we found people who had trained in our dojo 10, 15, even 20 years before we'd been there who told us, oh man, that was a horribly abusive environment. And I was like, nothing happened to make that Good. How, how do we keep other people from having this experience? This shouldn't be your first dojo experience, but when you walk in the door as a beginner, you have no idea. Everything seems normal. And there was nobody out there. Everybody that left just left and went and did other things. You know, there was nobody to, to tell the story or to, to warn us off. That. We'll yes. listen. So that's, you know, a wonderful, wonderful point, but Having tried to change things from within, I think sometimes that isn't doable. Um, if you look at the people here, I mean, you said it's just like a 12 step group, but you know, it's not a random group of people here. We're preaching to the choir and people here are all looking to make things, you know, I think doing well and want to make things better, but the ones who are on the other side of the stories aren't here. Um, you know, and, and having had the experience trying to change from within, I really, I think part of it is just you got to walk, you know? So, I mean, something can change. Um, policies are great, but what we've seen is that people make policies instead of doing the right thing. I mean, the people who are already on the right page firm it up with policies, but ones who aren't um, use it as a cover for not doing stuff. So it's a wonderful question, something to continue working on. And I think a big part of it, you know, I did put in one of my red flags, is putting that on the organization. The, the really cultish ones make it sound like we're the, o we're the only game in town. You know, first of all, you know, Aikido is life and breath and how could you leave Aikido and there's everyone else's shit. So, you know, take it, or, take it or leave it and you can't leave. And if you misbehave, you're gonna be shunned and you get out of there and people can't do it, so it goes on. Um, so I think a big thing is just for people to know that there is a world out there. I mean, say, you can go somewhere else. Well, you need to know that that's actually an option, um, and that that and then maybe that would take away some of their power and let them actually change. You know, when they know they're only game in town, they're going to stick with what they're doing. Um, so yeah, it's an ongoing discussion on how to make things better, but we're out of time. <laughs> yeah, we're going to wrap up soon. Neela, did you want to say something? Uh, we do have a few announcements, but um, yeah, so it's time for some some last comments. Neela, I. Yeah, I mean, I, I've had um, different people make suggestions on the Me Too Aikido, but recently someone was like, you have this pledge page for people that pledge for no um, sexual um, assault and abuse in dojos, but also they're like, can't you make a page for dojos that don't make you feel guilty and all the things we've been talking about today? Um, 
and it's challenging because I'm not going around and I'm not being um, having a certification course that people go to to be able to you know say what each dojo is doing but I wanted to start that movement just to get people to be thinking of how to share and how to make change and this is all part of that um but people I do get ideas every now and then and it's it's challenging to know how to um put that out there with you know Aikido has been around so long so many people have done it and left and I talk to a lot of people that have left too. So I, I want to kind of, um, yeah, your question, uh, it's all of our question, right? Uh, how do we change this um, and, and prevent um, more bad, you know, any more bad things from happening and uh, make more good things happen, right? Because so much good goes on in our dojos and in Aikido and how can we just keep supporting that? Um, it's kind of a, you know, you talk about 12 steps, it's kind of like we got to come out and I think that we, we're coming out, you know, we're talking, we're raising these issues, we're uh, speaking about things that have not been very uh, spoken about, or that there's even been an almost policies or traditions not to speak about. Um, so I think that this has, again, been part of what prompted Aikido Solstice to start in the first place, is that we want to start to raise these issues. We want to look at how we can make changes. We want to, in anything that we do, to to implement, you know, more equality, more inclusivity, more diversity, more, uh, more supportiveness, more um, transparency. So um, I know that we thank you all so much for being here. If anybody's really uh, has something that you haven't uh, said yet, please feel free to I know that we have a few announcements. Lisa, do you want to and I've, uh, we've all got a yeah, few announcements for you. And if you, you have an announcements, please share. Yeah, we have we have to speak up. People have to speak up. Like mm -hmm. Nilfar speaking up, you know, coming forth very publicly about the horrible experience, and and it give, if we speak up, if we come out, if we're open and transparent, then other people maybe even if it affects one person, they say, oh, I can speak up too, or no, what happened to me wasn't right. Somebody else feels the same way, and it's by it's by being present and open and verbal and sticking up, you know, and empowering others to do so by setting an example and, it, and not tolerating abuse, walking away from it and speaking up about it and creating safe places. And some change uh, will, some change, unfortunately, you can't, you can't ram change down people's throat. Um, for example, you know, Japan, Japan, Japanese culture, and I will, I will speak about this, about Hombu Dojo, they change slowly. I'm not saying every dojo in Japan accepts change slowly, but Hombu Dojo accepts change so slowly. And one of my uh, member dojo, they have a student who just passed the test who is non-binary. But on that application form for Hombu Dojo, you have to check one box or the other. Those are the only options they have. And the representative from the dojo said, can't you ram this change down their throat and make them change? I said, I cannot. If I try to ram anything down their throat, they will fight. But I can ask a question and say, I'm confused. I don't know what to do. And I can plant a seed. And then I can plant another seed. And I can water all the seeds I'm planting. And I can encourage other people to plant seeds and water them. And then those sorts of change will come. That's great. Yeah, no, I, I think uh, that's, and your organization is part of the change. Lisa, so really respect that. So um, yeah, so let's, we got to wrap things up. So um, just wanted to say, we're going to be sending out a video of this discussion. Again, please contact us if you would not want to appear, but we're also going to do a summary in our newsletter that we're going to send out in the next few weeks. We're going to start planning our next event. Some exciting events coming up include a women's camp in the Northeast, which is being organized right now by some of us. Uh, again, another really good safe space to talk about these issues and really, uh, you know, try to get in this, the theme of this year's women's camp is going to be action. So um, we're going to try to make, do some positive action toward, toward addressing a lot of these issues. Um, other yeah. announcements, um, just things coming up. Uh, Jamie, you got a couple, right? Anything yeah. else? Any Lisa, can we just let one more comment? I think somebody maybe felt the need to respond um, 
to what to Lisa brought up a really loaded topic, and I think maybe somebody wanted to comment on that. I think it seems like oh sure, go for it. Important. Yeah. Um, Mary Catherine, you have your hand up. Sorry about that. I thought I raised my hand earlier and I clicked on the wrong thing. Um, I um, I don't really want to comment on the on the content because it's at the end. But I wanted to let you know that the reason I'm here is I have left Aikido because of the toxicity in my dojo, and I'm trying to figure out a way to come back. So um, I'm mm -hmm. in active contact with one of the panelists, and we've been talking for a while and trying to figure it out. But um, I appreciate all the comments that you've made. Um, there were a lot of really valid points and it made me feel encouraged that there are other people out there that see these things. Nobody here is in, was in my dojo. So it, it, I'm hard pressed because there's nobody here to talk to. It's, it's a, it's a click. Um, and I left because of some major problems and I'm, and I've been participating in the Me Too, um, Aikido program as well. So, um, I just wanted to thank you and, and, um, I'm hoping that these, kind of seminars will help me find a way back to Aikido. Thank you. Oof. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of, again, what it's all about. So thank you so much. And um, glad you're in touch and uh, reach out, please. Uh, we hope that, um, you know, it, it, that's what we need to do is just really support each other and, and empower each other's voices and changes. So thank you so much. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say that this Friday, at noon Eastern time, 9 a.m. Pacific time on Zoom for 30 minutes, 30, 40 ish minutes, something like that. Um, I'm on the board of Ike Extensions and we have initiated an Ike author series. Our next uh, upcoming Ike author is our very own Lisa Klein. She's got, uh, <laughs> she's got several books already out there and she's working on a third, which is addressing uh, some of these issues. So we're gonna be interviewing her in our Ike author series, and we'll get the information out to you. It's free, it's on Zoom. Would love you to be there in person. If you can't make it, we do record those. And if you go to YouTube, Kathy Park Sensei, who we've had as a Solstice instructor, did an interview with her last month, uh, Aikido Off the Mat and Bowing into Sensei Glioblastoma. Her new work is uh, Bowing into Sensei Mortality. She's been dealing with a brain tumor through uh, and applying her Aikido practice. That particular interview, I wish everybody in the world would hear. You really should hear Kathy uh, Park Sensei speak. But if you uh, just put Ike authors in on YouTube, I think it'll, it'll pop up. Um, so yeah, please show up on Friday. That'd be great to support Lisa and uh, hear what she has to say. And I would like everybody to know that Ike Extensions has a seed grant program, seed and support grants. So we offer $1,000 or 500, 1,000, sometimes $2,000. If you have an Aikido-based project that you're doing, please be in touch. We actually have funds and we are looking to disperse even more of them. So we've done some really cool projects and are continuing to uh, support. I, I'm not sure if Tiger's here in Kenya uh, and uh, we're helping there and Ukraine and varying other places. Uh, it, it could be any kind of project. There was a woman who was asked to start in Florida a program at a mosque and for women and girls. So it could be anything, Aikido in schools, anything in your community, anything you wanna do that you want support with um, or dreaming of doing, could be something you're already doing. So please get in touch because we actually have funds that we want to disperse. Yeah, I think Ari was just mentioning Aikido Ideas Project has a new curriculum coming out. That sounds amazing. So we'll we'll put all details and links to all of these new these pro thing, upcoming things in our email coming up. So. And we're also hooking up with the Aikido Ideas Project. Mallory Graham, who's also one of the co-founders of Solstice Seminar, she couldn't be here today, but I know you've all been working together and uh, how to implement DEI in dojos, and sometimes that needs some monetary support. So. You know, we actually have monetary support to offer. Please be in touch. All right, are we wrapping up? Let's. This is just the last. Everyone. Anybody else want to announce anything of uh, relevant so, support? So this has been you know, an incredible conversation and it isn't ending. Um, we want to, hopefully we can stay connected both online. There's Facebook, which but some people don't like Facebooks. But you know, there's the Me Too page. We have conversations and Salsa's page. But off of Facebook, there's ikeaccess.org, 
Um, Ike Access is a nonprofit, which is acting as an umbrella for both Solstice and for Me Too. Um, and and this today has been a collaboration between the people who are involved in Solstice and Me Too, and there's a lot of overlap. But if you go to ikeaccess.org, um, we have discussion groups set up. You can continue to have this input, and we're going to take all that and really try to make something positive and concrete from it that we can share with you all. And we really welcome your ongoing input. All right. So, and um, after we close out, we can just stay on and, and chat for a little more. If people still have more things. We, you know, it was hard to have time for everybody. Janice, just also about that discussion group on IT Access. It's very easy. I think when you, when you enter into it, you're automatically set to private. So if you would like to chat anonymously within that IKEA access group, um, it's completely feasible. So I forgot to have us all bow in. We never said it on a geisha mas. <laughs> Let's for sure all say to everyone a big domo arigato gozaimashita. Thank you all so much for being here and for sharing, being honest, sharing, and for being part of the change that we wish to see, right, uh, in our Aikido world. Thank you so much, everybody.